Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the ayah number 16 of Surah at tawbah where we left off, or did you suppose that you would be left alone while God had yet to know whom among you strive and took no friend, no confidant, apart from God, the messenger, and the believers, and God is well acquainted with what you do. Now, as we mentioned in our previous lessons, Surah at tawbah began with a declaration of war. You know, in order for us to understand these verses, we have to go back to the context of the revelation of Surah at tawbah so Surah at tawbah begins with a declaration of war against the Mushrikeen, the polytheists who breached their treaty with the Holy Prophet. And then as the verses continue, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides justification for war. So the, the Surah begins with a declaration of war. You ask, why are we going to war? Isn't it, shouldn't we strive for peace? Is it necessary for us to fight in the battlefield? Is military conflict necessary? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then provides the justifications as to why war is imminent, why it has to happen, why it's necessary. And as you recall, in ayah number 13, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions three primary reasons why the believers have to go and fight the mushrikeen. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Nakathu that you tried to peacefully coexist with them. You allowed them to live amongst you. You were seeking a peaceful coexistence. You had an agreement. You enacted a treaty, but they violated the terms of the treaty. So that's, that's the first justification that's given for war. And in many cases, even in secular, among secular governments, this is, this is something that's understood, that if, if an agreement, a peace treaty is breached, even secular nations see that as possibly a declaration of war. So the first reason the first justification for war that was mentioned is the breaking of the treaty. Number two, Allah says, وَهَمُّوا That the Muslims who are in Medina now, Allah is telling them that you guys live in Medina because you were driven out of Mecca. You know, what we would call today refugees. That they expelled the messenger. They did not even allow the Prophet to live in his in the city that he grew up in. They expelled him. They expelled the messenger. They tried to assassinate him. And even after they drove the Prophet out of Mecca, it's not that they allowed him to live peacefully in Medina. You know, Abu Sufyan and the likes of Abu Sufyan, when they drove the Prophet, when they expelled him out of Mecca, when he went to Medina, they didn't say, okay, Muhammad is now in Medina and we're going to let him be. They continued to chase after him. They continued to persecute the Muslims. And this is why you see the different battles taking place in rapid succession because the Muslims are not being left alone. So the second reason that's mentioned is the expulsion of the Prophet from Mecca. With, with the other believers. And number three, Allah says, وَهُمْ بَدَأُوكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً That they are the ones who started. They're the ones who shot the first arrow. They're the ones who began. They're the ones who were antagonistic. So the reason why you see that Allah is mentioning these justifications is because there were many companions, many Muslims who were reluctant to fight. As you know, brothers and sisters, there were many Muslims who still had relatives, parents, siblings, extended family who were mushrikeen, who belonged to those tribes that violated the treaty agreements they had with the Prophet. 
So you see Muslims are reluctant to fight against the mushrikeen because they consider them family. And even if some Muslims don't have family members on the opposite side, they're comfortable. They don't want to fight. They finally establish themselves. They're enjoying the comforts of life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues and He encourages the mu'mineen to fight. He tries to raise their morale. He tries to entice them with the following. He says that Allah will punish them through your hands. That you will have, if you rise to the occasion, you will have the honor of doing God's work. You will be the hand of God. God will punish them through you. You will be an agent of God. And Allah says, وَيُخْزِهِمْ Allah will disgrace them. They've been, they have disgraced you. They have tried to disgrace you for many, many years. You have the opportunity to now humiliate them. وَيَنْصُرْكُمْ And Allah promises that He will support you. It's not that you're going to go alone and fight. Allah promises that He will fortify you with the malaika, with the angels. And then Allah goes on to say that He will Heal. Allah will heal the, heal the hearts of the believers. Now, in ayah number 16, again, Allah continues addressing the believers, the companions who are hesitant to fight. And mind you, brothers and sisters, this is an important lesson for us. If the Sahaba if a large portion of the Sahaba, and it seems that they were not, it wasn't just one or two, you know, to warrant the revelation of so many verses, it seems that there was a big problem. Many of the Sahaba were unwilling to fight while the Prophet was among them. And this is when? This is ninth year after the Hijrah. So we shouldn't wonder why after the death of the Prophet, only a handful of people were willing to stand with Ali ibn Abi Talib and fight against the illegitimate government. You see, brothers and sisters, how important this surah is. It gives us insight into the mindset of the Sahaba in the last years of the Prophet, the last two years of the Prophet's life. If the Sahaba, if the companions are so reluctant to fight in jihad, and Rasulullah is still among them and he's still alive and he's motivating them after the Prophet dies. Should it come as a surprise to you that Ali ibn Abi Talib only has four who are supporting him and willing to defend and fight for the Khilafah? It shouldn't. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 16, he addresses these individuals, these believers who are unwilling to go and sacrifice, who don't want to fight. Allah says, Am hasibtum and tutraku. Do you think that you would just be left alone? Now, what does this mean? What does Allah mean when He says, Do you think you're just going to be left alone? What it means is that Allah is asking them, do you think that you're going to be left alone in the sense that I'm not going to test you? That you're not going to go through any difficulties or trials or tribulations? That you're just going to sit in the comfort of your home? And that's it. That's what it means to be a believer, a mu'min, a pious person. So this whole why me attitude Allah is addressing. That why do I have to go and fight? Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to do that? Why do we have to go through these difficulties and these hardships and these calamities and tribulations? Allah in many verses in the Quran addresses this. That do you think that this life was designed to give you comfort? This earthly life, my dear brothers and sisters, wasn't designed to give you comfort. Jannah is the place of comfort. Allah says, Jannah is where you'll have your comfort. But this dunya is comparable to a boot camp, a spiritual boot camp. So one of the, one, a common theme in the Qur'an is to remind people that, do you think that Allah is just going to give you Jannah without you being tested? 
if for you look at if we go to surah al-baqarah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah al-baqarah verse 214 again a very similar message is conveyed allah says am hasibtum an tadkhulul janna do you think that you will enter paradise because everyone wants paradise you know as the saying goes everybody wants to go to heaven but no one wants to die right everyone wants jannah but no one wants to die no one wants to go cross the bridge allah says am hasibtum an tadkhulul janna do you think that you will be made to enter paradise do you think that you will be given paradise without enduring, without going through the things that previous nations had to endure? The people before you, they experienced misfortunes and calamities. And they were shaken up. You know, zulzilu comes from the word zalzala, zilzal, earthquake. You know, when there's an earthquake, you get shaken up. That Allah says, I put them through difficulties and I shook them up with calamities to such an extent. Now, listen to this. Allah in this ayah, in ayah number 241 of Surah Al-Baqarah, He's explaining the extent of the hardships that He put previous nations through. Allah says, I shook them up with hardships to such an extent that the messenger, prophets, and those who believe who are among them, حَتَّى يَقُولَ الرَّسُولِ so not just any believers, those who are the elite, who are very close to the messenger, that I shook them up to the extent that the, the messenger and those who are close to the messenger, they ask, when is relief going to come? When is the help of Allah going to arrive? Can you imagine how much you have to suffer for a prophet and the high-ranking mu'mineen to start to wonder when are we going to gain victory because we've been suffering for so long so again brothers and sisters Allah is reminding us he's reminding the Sahaba that are unwilling to go and fight that you think Jannah is for free Allah is gonna try you he's gonna test you in Surah Al-Ankabut you know we read the we read Surah Al-Ankabut on the nights of Qadr, Allah says, Alif Lam Mim, Ahasib al Nasu and Yutraku, a Yakulu Amenna, Wahum Laiftenu. Do you think that you're just going to say, I believe? You think Islam is just lip service? You think Islam is just talk? You think I'm not going to try you, fitna? You think you're not going to go through fitna? And the linguistic, one of the linguistic meanings of the word fitna is the process of purifying gold by putting it through pressure and heat allah says i'm going to put you through pressure and heat in order to see who among you is truthful and who among you is a liar now going back to ayah number 16 allah says do you think that i'm just going to leave you now, when you look at this part of the ayah, Allah says, do you think that I'm going to leave you without putting you through difficulties? While God had yet to know who among you strive. Now, when you look at this ayah, the apparent meaning, again, at first glance, the verse seems to suggest that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us so he can know who is a believer and who is a non-believer, who is striving and who is being lazy. This is what you understand at first glance. And this verse and other verses have become an important theological discussion 
about the nature of God's knowledge. Mufassirin have gone into great depth to understand the nature of Allah's knowledge. When we say Allah is Alim, that He's all knowing, what do we mean by that? Because we're confronted with a theological problem in this verse, at least the apparent meaning. Allah says, do you think that I'm going to leave you and I'm not going to test you while God has yet to know who among you is going to strive and who among you is not going to take a confidant other than God, the messenger and the believers? So when you read this verse, it's tempting to impose you know, this understanding that God tests us so he can see, so he can know, so he can discover who is mu'min and who is kafir. That who is a believer and who is a non-believer. Who is righteous and who is wicked. And the reason why it's tempting to do that is because we human beings, we have a tendency to liken God to ourselves. That we see God in our own image. And the reason why I say that this is a human tendency is because if you look at scriptures, if you look at the Bible, if you look at the Torah, you know, the, the Torah that was you know, distorted, the Bible that was later distorted, even if you look at Sahih al Bukhari, forget about non Muslim scriptures, look at, you know, the books of Ahadith that Muslims deem sacred. If you look at, for example, Bukhari, you see that there are many uh, Ahadith of Tajseen that attribute human qualities to God. Maybe I've mentioned this to you, where there's a Hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, and there are many. I can give you dozens of them that speak about the idea of God having eyes, that he has a foot, that he sits on a throne, that he can be seen with the physical eye on the day of judgment in the hereafter. The prophet, he was sitting with his companions one night and he looks up at the moon and Rasulullah says, Satarawna Rabbakum kama tarawna hadha al -qamar. That one day, very soon, you will see God in the same way that you see the moon. That you'll be able to see him with your eyes. So it's very tempting. And so, so this is what we get from Bukhari. Attributing human qualities to God. And then if you look at Al-Kafi, if you look at what the Imams of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, say about the nature of God's knowledge and the attributes of God, you see there is, there is a transcendental theology that is evident in the words of the Ahlul Bayt. That they speak about God as a being that is above space and time. That is unlike his creation. But when you look at Bukhari, you see that I have a lot in common with God in the sense that there are many human qualities that are being, that are being attributed to him. Now you and I, when it comes to our knowledge, Everything that we know is acquired. Why do I say that? I say that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Nahl, Surah 16, ayah number 79, He says, وَاللَّهُ أَخْرَجَكُمْ مِنْ بُطُونِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا God took you out of the wombs of your mothers while you knew nothing. All of us, every human being was born without knowledge. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the means to acquire knowledge. So we didn't know, we were ignorant, and then we gained knowledge. But in this ayah, when Allah says, Am hasibtum and tutraku walamma ya'lam Allah, that do you think you're going to be left alone while God has yet to know which one of you will strive? It doesn't mean that God is like us in the sense that he was ignorant and then he discovered, he came to know. 
Now, why is it? You may ask me, what's the problem in saying that God acquired knowledge, that God, something was revealed to him? Why can't we ascribe ignorance to God, the acquisition of knowledge to God? The reason is, brothers and sisters, if you say that God came to know something, that, a point, that in a point in time God discovered something, automatically what you did was you confined him to, to time because he was ignorant and there came a time where he knew something. So for example, you did something and then after you did it, God discovered your reality. But if you say that, you're, you're, you're saying that Allah is bound by time when we know that Allah is the creator of time. So this is number one. Ascribing the acquisition of knowledge to God implies that he is bound by time because there is a period of ignorance and then there is a sudden change. There is an acquisition of knowledge. And for that to happen, that only applies to beings that are confined and bound by time. And Allah is the creator of time. Secondly, if you say that God acquired knowledge, from his creation, you're essentially saying that God is impacted by his creation. There is a change that happens in him that is caused by his creation. And if he's perfect, why is there a need for him to change? So it kind of refutes the, the meaning of God, the concept of God itself. Now, when we speak about Allah's knowledge. You know, this this ayah is it's a very delicate verse because it's it deals with one of the most complicated areas of Islamic theology re relating to the nature of God's knowledge. The the ulama of kalam, the theologians, Muslim theologians, this they, they say that God's knowledge is of three types. There are three types of divine knowledge. The first, so Allah's ilm is of three types. The first is ilmuhu bidhati, God's knowledge of himself. Everyone else is trying to gain ma'rif of Allah. And gaining knowledge of God is an endless journey. No one can say that I am finished with ma'rifatullah. There is always room to get to know God more because God is infinite. And you cannot say that I have finished. You as a limited being cannot say that I have accomplished an unlimited task. Ma'rifatullah is an infinite journey. So God has complete knowledge of himself. Ilmuhu bidhat. This is number one. The second is Ilmuhu bil ashya qabla ijadiha. God's knowledge of things before they exist. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew you before you came into existence. So there is knowledge that he has before the existence of things or before the appearance of certain actions. So his knowledge of things before they exist this is the second type of knowledge. And the third, which, which is probably obvious, His knowledge of things after they come into existence. And this, this third category is what is being referenced in the eye. The realization of God's knowledge. That Allah makes what he knows come to pass. And I'll explain this in a bit more detail. I'll give you a simple example to illustrate what I mean, what I mean by this. The difference between the second type of knowledge and the third type of knowledge. Take for example, imagine a chef, right? 
you know, we Muslims like to give food examples, so we'll use a food example here. So imagine a chef for a moment. And imagine there's a chef who wants to prepare a dish. He wants to cook something. And they've gathered, this chef has gathered all of the ingredients. And this is a dish that he's made many times. The chef has two types of knowledge with regard to the taste of the meal that he's about to prepare. So he has knowledge of what it will taste like before he makes it. So imagine there's a chef who wants to make, you know, let's say fettuccine Alfredo. The chef knows what fettuccine Alfredo tastes like. The knowledge of what this meal will taste like before he's made it. And then his knowledge of what it tastes like after he tastes it. Allah's knowledge, when Allah says, وَلَمَّا يَعْلَمِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا مِنْكُمْ the meaning here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making what he knew manifest itself and go from potential to actualization. It's being realized. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, tribulations, this life is necessary for this third level of Allah's knowledge to come into reality. You know, many people ask, why doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala skip dunya and just put us in Jannah? Have you ever wondered? You know, we're always saying that Allah is so merciful and His mercy is beyond our imagination. But if Allah is merciful, why can't we skip this mess called dunya and we just appear in paradise. Why did not Allah just create us in Jannah? The reason why is because it's impossible. It's impossible to enter paradise until you go through this trial of dunya. In the same way, it's impossible, for example, for a newborn to enjoy honey until its digestive system becomes developed. The soul is not mature enough to experience paradise. It has to develop. And therefore you find the tribulations and the hardships of dunya are designed to manifest what is dormant in our hearts. That dunya is the only way where Allah's knowledge of us becomes manifested. So it's like there, there's a seed. And we have to go through this rain, rain period of dunya for this soul to come to fruition, for this soul to mature. Either it flourishes or it withers away. It's up. That's up to us, whether we're flowers that are going to wither or flowers that are going to bloom. But the point is that tribulations manifest and bring out our potentials into realization. And they reveal, these hardships reveal what is dormant in our hearts. And you find, brothers and sisters, no one can escape this. There is no such thing as a human being who does not experience hardship, does not experience some type of trial. In the same way, and this, is, this has been preordained, my dear brothers and sisters, in the same way that rizq, Allah doesn't have a system where in dunya He only gives rizq to mu'mineen. Allah doesn't only give sustenance to believers and pious people. And the evidence is that you look around, Allah gives rizq to kuffar, to mushrikeen, to tyrants. He gives rizq to everybody. 
In the same way that rizq is distributed to all creation, trials and tribulations and difficulties are also distributed among creation. Because the soul has to go through a process of maturation. So this knowledge of God is essentially making what Allah knew come to realization, come to fruition. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Am hasibtum an tutraku walamma ya'lam illahu alladheena jahadu binkum walam yattakhidu min doon illahi wala rasoolihi wala al-mu'mineena walijatan wallahu khabirun bima ta'lamun. So Allah says, or did you suppose that you would be left alone while God had yet to know? Meaning God's knowledge has yet to become realized. While God had yet to know whom among you strive. Because anyone can claim to be mu'min. But when the time comes that you actually have to make a sacrifice, this is when the real iman manifests itself or fails to manifest itself. While God had yet to know whom among you strive and took no confidant apart from God and the messenger and the believers. The word walija, some translate it as friend, but a better translation is a confidant, someone that you fully rely on and you reveal your secrets to. Now, it's important that we don't misunderstand this verse. You know, sometimes people, they come across verses where Allah says, you know, don't take the Jews and the Christians as your guardians. Or don't take, you know, don't take anyone other than God and the messenger and the believers as friends. They misunderstand this. And they say, oh, this means that I can't have non-Muslims friends or I can't have good relationships with people outside of the faith, the faith of Islam. That's not the case. Islam promotes peaceful relations with all people. Allah wants us to have good relationships with all people, with non-Muslims and Muslims alike. But Allah here is addressing mu'mineen and He's telling them that do not take the non-Muslims, the mushrikeen, as your confidants. Especially when we're talking about the context of war. This is wartime. Many of the Sahaba, they have relatives, they have family members, they have friends maybe who are kuffar, who are mushrikeen, and they had a very close relationship with them, and they may, see, they, may, they may still see them as very intimate friends. But Allah is telling them that now is the time to prove your iman. Don't be too intimate with them. Don't share your secrets with them. You should not have the same level of trust because the reality is that they don't believe that your religion is the truth. You shouldn't have the same level of trust with them as you have with Allah, Rasulullah, and the Mu'mineen. So the question here is for the Sahaba and for us in general, it is what is more important to you? These relationships, which are a liability or protecting your faith. Now, sometimes you might, you might have acquaintances, you might have friends, and you say, oh, I've known this person for a long time. And, I, and I, they, they were very close to me when I wasn't religious. This was my closest friend, you know, during my days of jahiliya. And now I'm, I'm a practicing Muslim. And I'm embarrassed to kind of distance myself. And I still have this intimate relationship with them. Allah says, this is a test here. What's more important to you? Maintaining this old friendship and keeping this person as a close confidant or preserving your faith? Sometimes people are not good for your spirituality. You know, brothers and sisters, in fiqh, we have certain rules and regulations that govern our interactions with non-mahram. If you're dealing with a non-mahram, you can't just be too comfortable. You have to maintain some formalities. 
This is with fiqh. With Irfan, for example, the Urafa, they actually treat people who are very dunyawi, they treat them as like non-mahrams in the spiritual sense. So in the same way, you're, you're meant to be very formal when you're interacting with non-mahram, people who care about their spirituality, they're very formal. They don't get too close to people who are not going to develop them spiritually because they see these relationships as a potential danger, a liability. They're nice. They're very pleasant. They maintain good relationships, but they're not going to get too close to people and jeopardize their spirituality. And this is what Allah wants to highlight. That what's more important to you? Having these close friends that you used to have in Jahiliya or protecting your faith. And especially now when this is in the context of war. Allah in the Holy Quran, what does He say? He says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surat Al-Hujurat, in Surat Al-Hujurat, is a very beautiful surah. It's known as Surat Al-Akhlaq, the chapter of ethics in the Quran. Allah says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً The word إِنَّمَا is أَدَاتُ حَصْرٍ It's a word that conveys exclusivity. Your only true brethren are mu'mineen. Mu'mineen, meaning if I have a biological brother who is non-Muslim, of course Islam wants me to maintain that relationship. I should treat my, bro my biological brother with respect and kindness and compassion. That goes without saying. But in Islam, a person who's living on the other side of the world, who I've never met, who is mu'min, is closer to me than my own biological brother who's non-Muslim. Why? Because iman, this iman, this faith, the bond of faith is more sacred in the eyes of Allah than even the bonds of blood relations. It's even more important than that. It's more sacred because... This is a relationship that will continue on, even in the Akhirah. You see, people who are not mu'mineen, you know, they're, they're very selfish. You see, even people in Jahannam, who used to be very close friends, they're now doing la'na on each other. That relationship disintegrates in Alam al Akhirah. But mu'mineen, their relationship in dunya exists, and it continues even after death. It's a very sacred bond. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the ayah, He says, وَاللَّهُ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَنُ And verily, and Allah is well acquainted with what you do. And it seems that the ayah ends this way to dispel a possible misconception that you might have had with relation to Allah's knowledge. That when the ayah began, Allah says, or did you suppose that you would be left alone while God had yet to know who among you strive? But then at the end of the ayah, Allah says, Allah is well acquainted with what you do. Which means that knowledge is not what we would understand at first glance, that Allah came to know, but rather God's knowledge is being actualized. Then you go to ayah number 17. <coughs> Allah says, مَا كَانَ لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ أَنْ يَعْمُرُوا مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ شَاهِدِينَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ بِالْكُفْءِ أُولَٰئِكَ حَبِطَتْ أَعْمَالُهُمْ وَفِي النَّارِ هُمْ خَالِدُونَ And I'll read ayah number 18 as well, and I'll translate it, because they're related. إِنَّمَا يَعْمُرُ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَأَقَامُ الصَّلَاهِ وَآتَ الزَّكَاهِ وَلَمْ يَخْشَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ فَعَسَى أُولَٰئِكَ أَنْ يَكُونُوا مِنَ الْمُهْتَدِينَ So Allah in ayah number 17, He says, It is not 
for the polytheists to maintain the mosques of God, bearing witness of disbelief against themselves. For those, their deeds have become worthless, and in the fire they will abide eternally. And in ayah number 18, Allah says, The mosques of God are only maintained by those who believe in God and the last day and establish prayer and give alms and, and, and not fear except God, or it is expected that these will be rightly guided. Now, these verses, again, Surah at tawbah if you recall, was revealed to the Prophet and it's being delivered by Ali ibn Abi Talib in Mecca. So if you remember in our first or second session, we said that when this surah was revealed, or at least part, a part of these, the first part of the surah, when it was revealed, the Prophet dispatches Abu Bakr to go deliver the verses. And then Jibra'il appears to him and says, O Muhammad, la yuballighu ank, la لا يبلغ إلا أنت أو رجل منك that no one can convey this message except you or some a man from you. So Abu Bakr is called back. Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib is sent to deliver this message. Now at this point, brothers and sisters, there are many mushrikeen who are still living in Mecca. And many of them are still performing hajj. They're still doing the, the rituals. And you see, brothers and sisters, that mushrikeen actually had great respect for Masjid al-Haram. They considered Masjid al-Haram so sacred that they would put their idols in the Kaaba. Why would they put their idols inside the Kaaba? Because they, they recognize that this is a sanctified place. In fact, Mushrikeen, even during the time of Jahiliyyah, the Arabs used to take pride in the fact that they used to serve the pilgrims, the Hajjaj. They would spend their own money to, to give water and to serve the Hajjaj. So this was considered a great honor for them. Now, there's a narration that says there was a conversation between Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, and Shayba, one of the, the Muslims. And Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, and Shayba, they were talking about how they used to maintain Masjid al-Haram during the time of Jahiliyyah. And they were bragging about it. So they were talking about what gives a person honor. And they were talking so much about how honored they were. That during the time of Jahiliyyah, when they were kuffar, they were the custodians of Masjid al-Haram. And they were maintaining Masjid al-Haram. Amir al-Mu'mineen salam is telling them, and this is a hadith that's even mentioned in, in I believe also Sunni hadith literature, if I recall. Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, true honor is having iman, fighting in jihad fi sabilillah, striving for the sake of God, and struggling for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is where the honor is. You know, going on hijrah, leaving behind your homes, going on hijrah, these sacrifices, having faith, doing good deeds, this is what gives you honor. But they were arguing that, no, we were, we were doing this and that during the time of Jahiliyyah. We were maintaining Masjid al-Haram during the time of Jahiliyyah, and they're boasting about this. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he say? مَا كَانَ لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ أَنْ يَعْمُرُوا مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ that it is not for the polytheists to maintain the mosques of God. 
Shahidina ala anfusim bil kuf, and they bear witness against themselves that they were kufa. You're not, this is not an honorable thing, maintaining, even if they do a perfect job. It's not considered something that has value. It's not something that you should be proud of. That during when I was kafir, you know, I was put in charge of maintaining Kaaba. This is not an honor. That someone who doesn't believe in Allah and is maintaining. So I want you to think about this for a second. And this shows you how it's not just about the deed itself. You may say, oh, they're doing, they're doing a good deed. They're maintaining Baytullah. You know, how many times do we as human beings, we have a tendency to assess the value of an action just on the action itself. But we don't pay attention to the doer of the action. The niyyah. The iman of the person. Allah says, maintaining Masjid al-Haram while you reject me as your Lord. This is not an honor. Even if you perfected the logistics of Masjid al-Haram. And we do the same thing sometimes. We build mosques and we work on all these projects, but we don't do it fi sabilillah. We don't do it for the sake of Allah. We do it because we want to be well known. We do it for the sake of popularity, for the sake of being known. It doesn't have value. In the same way, if a kafir were to maintain Masjid al-Haram, it doesn't have value because they reject their Lord. And their actions are worthless. It's worthless if you and I, we initiate this huge project and we build hospitals and we do all of these things. It doesn't have value if it's not visa Allah may reward us in dunya, but in the akhirah we have nothing. We're bankrupt. That's not honor. True honor is to have the right motivation. It's to have iman, to be connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah says, إِنَّمَا يَعْمُرُ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ The mosques of God are only maintained by those who believe in God and the last day. So Allah mentions five qualities that you have to have for your deed of maintaining the mosques of God to actually have value. To believe in Allah, to believe in the Akhirah. So you have the right Aqidah, right? And th these are the pillars of our Aqaid. Believing in Allah and the Akhirah. Wa aqamu salah wa atas zakah. You, now, as, as a mu'min, you can't just be, have just these ideas. I believe in God and you, I believe in the hereafter. It has to be translated into action. Meaning, you have to establish the prayer. You can't say, oh, my faith is in my heart. You have to establish the prayer. You have to observe Allah's right over you. And salah is a symbol of God's right over you. And you have to also give zakat. Meaning a mu'min cannot just say, oh, I believe in Allah, I believe in the hereafter, and I'm just going to pray, and I'm not going to care about people. Everyone's on their own. This is selfish iman. You have to also pay attention to haqq al-nas. You have to be concerned about people. So someone who believes in God and you know, believes in the hereafter, and they pray, you know, they honor, they honor Allah's haq. Their good deeds also don't have very much value because they don't care about people. وَآتَ الزَّكَاةِ وَلَمْ يَخْشَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And you do not fear anyone other than God. You know, especially if this is the context of war, if you are going to be maintaining the mosque, are you willing to protect Baytullah from attack? You know, just like many of the mu'mineen have done, you know, and for the shrine of Sayyidah Zayna, the shrines of the Ahlul Bayt. Do you fear Allah or are you afraid of these enemies? These are the people that are perhaps are expected to be rightly guided. Inshallah, we'll go into more details on these verses. And in the upcoming verses, there's going to be a discussion about you know, the, having the honor of 
being the one who gives water to the Hajjaj and Allah will speak about you know who's really qualified and to maintain the mosques and what what action actually has value and what are the prerequisites for any action to have value in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to have worth in the hereafter now the discussion is is about maintaining Masajid Allah and the Mufassireen many of them because this this topic was brought up the virtue of maintaining the house of God you know when we're at home you know we like to maintain our homes you know we we there's we pay attention to the cleanliness you know we take care of the masjid we look after the masjid and this is unfortunately a virtue that is you know lost in many of our communities you know when we go to Baytullah, when we go to the masjid wherever it is it doesn't necessarily only have to be masjid al-haram any masjid unfortunately you see many of our masajid they're not very clean you go to the bathrooms if you look at the carpet they're run down we don't treat them with the sanctity that they deserve and that's why we have a hadith the ahlul bayt have mentioned the importance of maintaining the mosques there's a hadith from the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi he says man asraja fi masjidin sirajan if someone puts a lamp in the masjid you know you know something that would be you know uh, relatable you know if someone covers the electricity bill for the masjid you know you help with the maintain maintenance of the masjid rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi says lam tazal al malaikatu that a person who illuminates the masjid, you know, you put a lantern, you, you cover the electricity bill. Rasulullah says the angels, and the Prophet doesn't specify how many, it seems the entire angelic realm. And not just any angels, even the highest angels who are holding the throne of God, Hamalat al Arsh, they do istighfar. They ask Allah to forgive such a person as long as those lights are on in the masjid. So this shows you, brothers and sisters, how, how important it is for us to offer this respect to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unfortunately, we treat the masjid as you know, we treat it like it's a dump, like it's a jungle, like it's, you know, like a, a, a playground, you know, for our children. Now, there's no problem in children, you know, playing and enjoying themselves, but we need to pay attention to the, the maintenance of the massage. So this is just, you know, a reminder for all of us, inshallah. So we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين